Ezekiel chapter 47. We'll begin reading in verse 1. We'll read verses 1 to 5 and verse 9. Ezekiel 47. This is concerning the millennial river of life. And I'm going to bring spiritual application out of these some verses here and bring a message this morning. Ezekiel 47 verse 1. Afterward, he brought me again unto the door of the house. And behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. For the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under, from under, from the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. Then brought he me out of the way of the gate northward, and led me about the way without, under the utter gate, by the way that looketh eastward. And behold, there ran out waters on the right side. And when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits and he brought me through the waters. The waters were to the ankles. Again, he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters. The waters were to the knees. Again, he measured a thousand and brought me through. The waters were to the loins. Afterward, he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass over. For the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. Verse 9, And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth, whithersoever the river shall come, shall live. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither. For they shall be healed, and everything shall live whither the river cometh. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you, God, for this wonderful singing. Lord, what talent you've given this church. Uh, just all these people that sang, dear God, and the younger people, the older folks, Lord, and we just want to thank you, God, and praise you for the ability, God, the ability that you've given these folks to sing in this church, dear God. And we pray, Father, that you'll continue to bless this church. And Father, we just pray if there's a lost soul here in the building that you, God, would deal with their heart and life. Father, that you would save them before they leave this building today. I pray for your people, God, that you'd help us, Lord to live for you, God, and to be exactly what you want us to be in the year 2020. Help us truly to have a 2020 vision. God, help us to go after souls this year like we never have before. I pray in Jesus' name, and amen. This here is a river of life. That is not the river of life of the New Jerusalem in Revelation 22, verses 1 and 2. This river proceeds out of the temple, it says in verse 1. The river of life proceeds out of God's throne in the New Jerusalem in Revelation 22 and verse 1. And there is no temple in that city in Revelation 21, verse 22. This river heals and gives life to fish. It says in verse 9, we read there, not people, like in Revelation 22, verse 2. Yet it's a, it's a picture of the river of life in eternity. In verse 12, just as the millennial lake of fire is a picture of the eternal lake of fire in Revelation 20, verse 14. Doctrinally, I understand that Ezekiel 47 is millennial passages. As a matter of fact, in Ezekiel chapter 40 
through chapter 48, the end of the book of Ezekiel, those nine chapters, all of those chapters deal with the millennial temple. And I'm not getting into all those doctrinal things. But I want to bring spiritual application from these waters. You'll notice here in verse 3, the end of the verse, <clears throat> the waters were to the ankles. <clears throat> verse 4 says the waters were to the knees. The end of verse 4 says the waters were to the loins. Verse 5 says waters to swim in. That is hands deep. Hands. And then the fifth stage is the end of verse 5, a river that could not be passed over. That's over the head. I'm bringing a message this morning. How deep have you gone with God? How deep are you going to go this year with God? I looked up the word deep because I want to give you a few verses by way of introduction, then I'll give you the outline to the message. But 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9 and 10, Paul said, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Verse 10 goes on to say, But God hath revealed them unto us. For the Spirit searcheth all things, here it is, yea, the deep things of God. The deep things of God. Now when I talk about going deep with God, I'm not talking about you know, a lot of people, you know, they want to talk about the Antichrist left toenail during the last half of the tribulation. You know, they want to go deep into the scriptures, you know, and talk about all this far out stuff and everything, you know, where there's really no scriptures to back up a lot of it up. I'm not talking about those deep things. I'm talking about going deep with God, deeper with God in your experience with God. Listen to this, Genesis 49, 25. Even by the God of thy father who shall help thee, and by the Almighty who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, here it is, blessings of the deep that lieth under. Blessings of the deep that lieth under. Blessings of the breast and of the womb. That's Genesis 49, 25. How about this? Job 12, 22. He discovereth deep things out of darkness and bringeth out to light the shadow of death. Psalms 92, 5. O Lord, how great are thy works and thy thoughts are very deep. The psalmist says, God, your thoughts are very deep. Psalms 107, verses 23 and 24. They that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord, and watch this, and His wonders in the deep, His wonders in the deep. Daniel 2.22 He revealeth the deep and secret things. Daniel 2.22 He revealeth the deep and secret things. You know what Jesus Christ told Peter in Luke 5 verse 4? Jesus said to Peter, launch out into the deep. That's what we ought to do this year, folks, in 2020. Let's launch out into the deep and let down your nets, Jesus told Peter, for a drought. That's Luke 5, 4. 
How about Romans 11.33? Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. And then, talking about the devil, Revelation 2.24. As many as have not this doctrine, written to the church at Thyatira, and which have not, here it is, which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak. So the devil has depths. I want to go deep with God. Amen? I want to ask you, this is the fifth day of the year. We're only five days into the new year. How deep are you going to go with God this year? You say, I'm just going to play around and fool around and mess around just like I always have for years and years, Brother Kogel. No, don't do that. I'm just going to play church and play religion and smile at everybody and act like I'm spiritual and everything. No, let's be more spiritual for God. Let's go deeper with God. Water is a type of the Spirit of God. And Jesus said, I, I am come that they might have life, they might have it more abundantly in John 10.10. 10. Abundant life is going deep with God. Abundant life. Now several times the Bible speaks of abundant. Abundant joy, abundant life, abundant grace, abundant power, abundant supply, and abundant entrance. That's what God wants for all of us. You've got to go deep with God. Deeper with God. I, I guarantee you these, these uh, preachers, and I know there's probably other people in the church that are going through a lot of things too. I'm not just trying to single out those three because I know people in a church this size, uh, you know, a lot of people are going through a lot of different things. But specifically these three men, these three preachers, I guarantee you if you talk with them, they could probably say, they probably would say that through this experience with this cancer and the stuff they had to go through, that they have gone a little bit deeper with God. Things like that have a tendency to make you go a little bit deeper with God. I'm not saying that everybody's got to get cancer to go deeper with God. Praise God for that. Amen. But I'm just saying that a lot of people go through a lot of different things, a lot of different trials. A lot of different experiences that calls you to go deeper with God. Sometimes God allows things in our lives so we will go deeper with God. John 7, 38 and 39, Jesus said, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. That's what we have here in our text in Ezekiel 47. The, different, the waters, the rivers of waters and so forth. I don't have time to go into all these waters and things that are mentioned here, but John 7, 39, but this spake he of the Spirit simply means that the Spirit-filled Christian will be a channel of blessing. One of the sins of a lot of churches is the shallowness of its members. I'm not trying to be a smart aleck this morning, but a lot of saints of God have been saved for years, but they haven't gone very deep with God. One of the reasons is that they're not in a good Bible-believing, Bible-preaching and teaching church where they can hear the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. Now, for the power of God and to go deep with God, it takes some digging. It's like a coal miner. Those coal miners, they show pictures of them sometimes. They'll go a mile or two miles into the mountains. Three miles. And, of course... The ceiling isn't no higher than this. And they have a, a rail that they have the cars go, you know, right around in, underneath the, in the mines there. I get claustrophobia just looking at it. There's no way I'm going a mile or two. I'm not going 20 feet inside the mines. But they get in there and they work. and They, they dig for that coal that helps us light our homes up and elect, you know uh, we need coal for a different heating and different things i know the left wingers want to do away with coal don't get me started on politics i'll get in the flesh amen i don't want to do that I'm trying to be nice 
But it takes some digging. They got to get in there and dig in them. They got to dig for that coal. I'll tell you what, if you're going to go somewhere with God, you got to do a little bit of digging. You say, what do you mean digging? Hosea 10, 12. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord. It's time to quit playing around. We're in 2020 now. And let's go deeper with God this year. In every area of our lives, folks. Just make up your mind you're going to serve God regardless if anybody else does. Anybody in your family, your neighbors, your kinfolk, relatives, uh, anybody else. You're going to serve God. Make no mistake, if the Spirit of God moves in a service, it is because somebody went deeper with God. If the Spirit of God moves in a church service, it's because somebody went deeper with God. In order to have a heaven-sent Holy Ghost move of God, we must have the power of God. Jesus said, for without me, you can do nothing. John 15, 5. Every child of God has the Spirit of God. Romans 8, verse 9. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of God, he is none of his. The question is, does the Spirit have you? You say, well, Brother Kogel, the Holy Spirit, God has most of me, but... There are some different areas that, uh, of my life that I don't want to take the Lord into that room. Why not? Say, Lord, I'm yours. I'm yours. How deep have you gone with God? <clears throat> First thing I want to say is, is notice here in Ezekiel 47.3, the end of the verse, it says the waters were to the ankles. The ankles. Now look here. My ankle. Right here. That's not real deep. But that's where a lot of saints of God are. Spiritually speaking, I'm talking about. Uh, the waters were to the ankles. Spirit filled. We need spirit filled feet. Spirit filled feet are faithful feet. Faithful feet go where God wants them to go. We don't have time to go to the book of Proverbs. There's a bunch of verses in Proverbs about your paths, what path you take. All through Proverbs, filled with it. Your paths, where your feet go. Spirit filled feet are faithful feet. It says in Luke 4.16 that Jesus' custom was to go to the synagogue. So your feet, if they're going to be faithful, every time the doors of this church are open, you ought to be here if you're able. If you're able. There's times people aren't able. They're sick and they're in the hospitals. Things have come up. God knows that. But we're talking about if you're able. You ought to be here every Sunday, every Wednesday, wherever your services are. I mean, you ought to be, this year, 2020, we want to have faithful feet, ankles. Faithful feet, ankles. Spirit-filled feet. I had a podiatrist tell me one time when I went in there because I got diabetes and I got a little touch of neuropathy in my feet. And he told me, he said, he said, the most neglected part of your body, the average person's body, is their feet. He said, people make fun of the feet. They make fun of toes. All that. He said, but think about it. He said, every time you stand up, he said, all your weight's on your feet. He said, people need, we, you need to take care of your feet. Spirit-filled feet. Spirit-filled feet are faithful feet. Spirit-filled feet are separated feet. Psalms 1 1, blessed is the man that walketh not, walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Folks, don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Don't go to people that don't know the Bible for counsel. 
Don't go to carnal, backslidden Christians. Go to somebody that knows God and walks with God. Spirit-filled feet are faithful feet, separated feet. Spirit-filled feet are soul winners' feet. Ephesians 6.15, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Some, some people never say a word to somebody about salvation. They never invite people. They're just not concerned. I'm not trying to be mean, but I want to ask you, you don't have to raise your hand or nothing, but I want you to just think of this in your mind. Last year, in 2019, January 1st until December 31st, which was what, last Tuesday? This past Tuesday? All right. From January 1st to December 31st, I, wanna, I just want to ask you this. and Just think of the answer in your mind. How many people in that in last year, in 2019, did you actually talk to about the Lord? Not about politics. Not about the weather, not about your job, not about how much money you make or don't make, not about your family, not about... It. How, how many people did you actually... I'm not saying you had to talk an hour to them, but how many people did you at least pass out a track to, say something to about the Lord, invite them out to church? How many times did you do that in 2019? You know what, folks? You know what we ought to say? We ought to say, I'm going to do more of that this year. Amen? Amen. Yeah. <clears throat> you don't have to preach an hour to everybody. Matter of fact, people don't want to hear it anyways. Most people. All right? They might let you go a couple minutes, but they're not going to let you go. But all you got to do is just give them a gospel track and say, hey, this will tell you how you can know for sure if you died, you'd go to heaven. It's our church address is on the back of that little track there. Come on out and visit us sometime. Love to have you. How long that take? Ten seconds? That's all you got to do. Now, if they want to hear more, that's fine. Most people don't. But you see, <clears throat> spirit-filled feet are soul winners' feet. He that winneth souls is wise. <clears throat> Proverbs 11.30. You have never been in a fight until you try to win souls. This church tries to get the gospel out and does get the gospel out through all of your different ministries that you've got here. That's why the devil hates your guts. Despite what some Christians might not even understand and realize, the devil doesn't want the gospel being preached. The devil doesn't want the gospel out. That's why he tells you that it don't do no good and don't do it. <laughs> See, that's what the devil does. It's a spiritual warfare. So spirit-filled feet are soul winner's feet. Secondly, notice here in Ezekiel 47.4, it says there at the end of the verse, or uh, the beginning of the verse, again, he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters. The waters were to the needs. Now, look here. Now we've gone. The water has gone from the ankles to the knees. Got a little higher. Some Christians have gone a little far, a little deeper with God. Some Christians have gone a little deeper. They've gone from the ankles to the knees. A lot of Christians in America, I don't know about the other countries, but a lot of Christians in America are somewhere probably between the ankles and the knees, spiritually. I mean, being in the ministry 42 years, pastoring churches, evangelism around the country, talking, observing people through the years, I personally believe, my personal opinion, I don't have no data or statistics for this or a survey or anything for this, but I personally believe that most Christians are in the first two stages. There might be a few in the loins around that there in the third stage, but, but and very few in the fourth and fifth, which we'll get to. Because most Christians, just, they just, they're wrapped up in the world. That's just the way it is. 
They got so much world on them, they don't have very much God on them. Because the world and God are at enmity. Love not the world, neither things that are in the world. 1 John 2.15 Friendship with the world is enmity with God. James 4.4 Spirit-filled knees. The water's word of the knees, it says in verse 4. Spirit-filled knees are humble knees. Philippians 2, verse 3, let each esteem other better than themselves. That's hard to do. That's hard to esteem your brother and sister better than yourself. You, put, you allow your brother and sister to go ahead of you, to be in front of you. This means to exalt your brother. Your sister. You become their servant. Uh, instead of being jealous and envious. Spirit-filled knees are humble knees. Spirit-filled knees are submissive knees. Philippians 4.11. Paul said, not that I speak in respect of want. For I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I want to tell you what. My, I, my mother-in-law. A lot of people make jokes about their mother-in-law. I had probably the, one of the greatest mother-in-laws in the world. Honestly. She died here back in 012. She was almost 89 years old then. But she loved God. And she was contented. She didn't have hardly nothing. I'll tell you what. You can't beat a contented person. When somebody's content, you can't just, you can't ruffle their feathers. They're just... They're just content. You can show them all the things of the world and everything, like the devil did Jesus in the temptation. You could show them that all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. You could show them all that. It don't do a whole lot for them. Pete, uh, my, my wife is the seventh of eight children. She's number seven, praise God. And uh, I got four older, four brother in laws older than me. And, uh, they, they would do things for her. They try to, all the kids, eight children, they would try to, and the daughters, they try to, you know, buy them some. Mom, we're going to buy you this for Christmas. We're going to get you this for your birthday. Oh, no, don't you spend money on that. Spend it on your kids and grandkids. Don't spend it on me. Contented. You said, well, she must have lived in a million dollar house. Wrong. She had a Down syndrome daughter, my. Sister-in-law, Sue, she's Down syndrome. She died here a few years ago. But she stayed home and took care of her a lot. And I'm telling you what, she was just contented. And she just had the peace of God. I see people that aren't contented. They got a lot of the world, worldly things and a lot of the toys of the world and everything. And they just... They're just constantly worried to death and they're just... <sighs> they got money coming out their nose, man. They're just... <sighs> Spirit-filled needs. Some become bitter because of sickness, finances, and other different things. But I'll tell you what. Submissive, submissive knees are uh, uh, spirit filled knees are submissive knees, and uh, spirit filled knees are praying knees, daily interceding, prevailing prayer. Now, the next book after Ezekiel is Daniel. Turn over just a few pages, keep your finger in Ezekiel 47, but turn over to Daniel 6, just a few pages, and I want to show you Daniel here what he did. After they signed a federal law that you're not allowed to pray to anybody except the king. Look what Daniel does in Daniel 6.10. Daniel chapter 6 verse 10. I'm talking about spirit-filled knees are praying knees. Look at this. Spirit-filled knees are praying knees. Alright. Daniel 6.10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed... He went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem. Watch this now. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. All right, let's go back to Ezekiel 47. So just as Daniel had always done, 
got down on his knees three times a day and prayed to God. Think about that. Spirit-filled knees are praying knees. Thirdly, Ezekiel 47, the end of verse 4, says the waters were to the loins. Now we're going up a little bit higher. From the ankles to the knees to the loins. Some Christians have gone that deep with God. They've, they're in the third stage. Most are probably in the first two stages, the ankles and the knees. But there's some that have gone a little deeper with God. They want a deeper experience with the Lord. They want to get closer to God. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. James 4, 8. It's kind of like chess or checkers. If you play chess or checkers, it's, it's your move. And then it's the other guy's move. Well, God says it's your move. You draw nigh to God, and He'll draw nigh to you. You see that? It'd be like Pastor Kim. Let's say that he, for the sake of illustration, that he's God. For the sake of illustration. And I'm a wicked, rotten, low-down sinner. Or I'm a saved sinner, saved by the grace of God. Pastor Kim, if you could stand up just for a second. Watch this. He said, draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you. He comes a little bit. Draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you. I can get just as close to God as I want to get. Watch it. Hey, you say that's stupid. No, this is what John did. John at the Last Supper in John 13, he put his head on the breast of Jesus Christ who is God. Like this. He heard the heartbeat of God. Thank you, preacher. He heard the heartbeat of God. You can get just as close to God as you want to get. But when Peter, right before Peter denied the Lord, you know what Peter did? He followed afar off. Peter was going like this. Uh, I don't go to church no more. I don't read my Bible no more. I don't pray no more. I'm mad at that church. I don't like the preachers. I don't like the Christians. I don't like anybody. I hate everybody. Some people, some of God's people have chosen to do that. Get away. You draw nigh to God, He'll draw nigh to you. You draw nigh to God. Hey, whether I'm close to God or not, God's still God. Now, it grieves God. God wants me to be close to Him. But John actually had his head on the heartbeat of God, on the bosom of Jesus Christ. That's pretty close. That's why John is that disciple whom Jesus loved, it says five times in the Gospel of John. John's a picture of the church. The church ought to be right there on the bosom of Jesus Christ. Woo! We ought to shout and run the aisles. John's caught up in Revelation 4. He's a picture of the church being raptured. Whoa! Ain't that Bible put together, honey? That's why we ought to be close to God. The disciple whom Jesus loved. You say, didn't he love all of them? Yeah, but I'm, I don't know if you want to say a special love or whatever. I don't know what you want to call it. But I'll tell you what, Jesus and John... To further prove it. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I thirst. Hanging on the cross. Looks down. You know what pain he was in? Can you imagine nails in your hands and your feet? I get a little splinter in my finger. It hurts. I tell my wife, get a needle. Uh, put it under the fire there and... Uh, uh, what do you call it? Sterilize. There you go. Thank you. Sterilize it. Sterilize it. She go in there. She'll turn the light on. And she'll and she'll pull it out, and the, you can't even see the thing. It's like it's like this little. I said that caused all that pain. 
He had nails in his hands. Not little splinters. And his feet. And while he's hanging on the cross, he looks down at John and says, Behold thy mother. And looks at Mary and says, Behold thy son. On the cross of Calvary, he's thinking about the future plans of his mother. How about that? John could have said, I don't have time to preach all this. I'm trying to stay in Ezekiel. But John could have said, what? I ain't taking care of your mother. You got brothers, sisters. I know the Catholic Church says you don't, but you do. They say you're a perpetual virgin. You had other kids. We know that because we're Bible believers. I'm not taking care of your mother. Somebody else can take care of her. My rights. John did. We don't know how long Mary lived or John lived. But it's implied in the scriptures that he took her into his house and took care of her when she died, whenever that was. Jesus and John. Something there. I mean, Jesus loved Peter, but Peter stuck his foot in his mouth all the time. I mean, he loved Peter, but it was like, I don't know, he was close to Peter, but there's something about John. And it doesn't have to be just John, it can be you. You and I. You and I can be close to Jesus. If you want to. You say, I really don't want to. Well, you won't go deep with God. You can have just as much God as you want to have. Uh, spirit-filled, spirit-filled loins means a strong back. Ephesians six thirteen. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Now some people stand by and wait for someone else to do it. Some people stand in the way and don't want anybody else to do it, do anything. Some people stand out if they get praised. You know what I found out? I'd rather have God's praise than the praise of man. Amen. Strong loins means a strong back. I'm going to tell you what, if you're going to serve God, you've got to be able to bear some things. There'll be disappointments. There'll be discouragements. There'll be trials and tribulations. There'll be things that'll knock you off your feet, man. You'll say, whoa, I didn't see that coming. Devil blindside you. Spirit filled loins means a strong back. Spirit filled loins. Means. A sacrificing hip. You say hip. What do you mean hip? Shazam, as Gomer Pyle used to say. Remember old Gomer? He used to say, surprise, surprise, surprise. We all found out he was a sodomite and he really was a prophet. Amen. <laughs> hip, loins, hip. Now looky here. Sacrificing hip. this. If God don't have your pocketbook or billfold, He doesn't have you. You ever notice? <laughs> you ever notice how quiet it gets? Yeah, when you start talking about, yeah. But you, ever, you ever notice something else? You ever notice that this here, this here, is this here is what everybody in America loves. And it's what a lot of people talk about. But they don't want the preacher to talk about it. Whoa! 
glory to God. Hallelujah. Isn't that weird? You know why I've never been offended and got quiet and got upset when the pastor or preacher or anybody talked about giving tithes and offerings to God? Because I always, I have. I didn't the first year. I thought God about it. It's like probably some of you. I was a young Christian. I, I got saved. And you know who God, you, God you're not going to believe it. A Pentecostal woman. Viola Williams. Where I worked at Rexall Drugs Warehouse in Columbus, Ohio. I got saved and she said, now Stevie. She called me Stevie. She said, now, Stevie, she goes, you got to, you don't be, don't forget to tithe when you go to church. I said, tithe. I said, that's Old Testament. I, I kind of like some of you try, trying to get out of it, you know. And, uh, of course, I was a year old. I wasn't even a year old in the Lord. And uh, she said, oh, no. She said, that's in the New Testament, too. She said, you can't outgive God and this and that. God dealt with me through a Pentecostal woman. About giving tithes and offerings. You say, I can't afford to. Man, I make a lot of money, preacher. You can't afford not to. Brother Homer Smith used to say about tithes and offerings. First of all, he said, Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek before the law in Genesis. And then it's under the law in Leviticus. And the New Testament is great, the grace of giving. Giving grace. I mean, we ought to give really more. But Brother Homer Smith used to say, I'd rather have 90% of my money with the blessing of God on it than 100% of it with the curse of God on it. You see that? That doesn't control me. I control it. I tell you what to do. And I do what God wants me to do with it. My wife and I give tithes and offerings to our church. I don't believe I, I, I sent it to Benny Hinn. You send it to a preacher, a television, radio preacher. Do they come and visit you in the hospital? The local church. You make $800 a week, $80 a week goes to this church. If you come to this church. You make $1,200 a week, $120 a week. You, you have a monthly income of $4,000, at least, at least $400 a month comes to the church. You say, what? I can't afford that. I got bills. Don't max out 13 credit cards. You know why they want you to get credit card? So they can charge you 23% interest. That's why in all these malls and all these stores, they got people at the door saying, would you like to apply today for a credit card? Would you like to apply today for a credit card? They know the average person in America is going to jack the thing up to several thousand dollars. Amen. Brother Estep told me a couple of different times back years ago, he had missions conferences all the time. He had two missions conferences a year. They support a bunch of money in missions above the tithes. And uh, anyways, make a long story short, he told me to my face, he said, Brother Kogel, he said, I got people, good people in my church. He said, they just don't know how to handle money. They just don't know how to handle money. And what they do is, is they, uh, they have maxed out credit cards. They've got nine different uh, bills. They got this payment and that payment and this payment and that payment and everything else. They bought this on credit and they bought that on credit. They got this payment, that payment. And he said, I got good people. These are good people in my church. And he said, they come to me with tears in their eyes and they say, preacher, I'd love to give to that missionary. I'd love to give to that missions project. I'd love to give to this next. He was taking up offerings all the time for missionaries. But he said, I can't. They said, I can't. I'm in such financial bondage. That's of the devil. It is. I know people get mad about this kind of preaching. I know people don't understand. 
People don't care if you preach about everything in the Bible except money. And Jesus talked a lot about money. It's where your priorities are. It's where your priorities are. We won't turn there for the sake of time. But over there in Malachi 3, 8 to 10. By the way, you say it's Old Testament. Jesus commended tithing in Matthew 23, verse 23. It's one of the things he commends, tithing. You say, I make $2,000 a week, preacher. That means you're telling me i got to give 200, at least 200 a week as a tithe? I didn't say it. Bible. You say, I don't, I don't think we ought, I need to give it to the church. How do you keep these lights on? How do you keep the air conditioning on? You know what it costs to air condition and put lights and everything and all the bills around here? You got this plumbing thing out here now. I was standing out there a few minutes ago for the service when the man told your pastor how much is they're going to charge for the, to dig the holes and stuff out here. Let alone the $600 for the porta potties. And then if you need a septic system, that's going to be a lot more. Fifty bucks no more. This is the 1950. That's why God says that's why God wants Christians to give tithes and offerings. Amen. Amen. I'll tell you what, you'll have more joy in your Christian life if you start doing what God wants you to do with your money. You say, I'm gonna hog it all. I'm going to take it all with me in my casket in my grave. You ain't taking a dime with you. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. 1 Timothy 6. What you ought to do is start investing your money in souls. Souls, eternal, eternal thing. When you get to heaven, God's going to... 1 Corinthians 3 talks about the judgment seat of Christ. In that context, it talks about sowing and watering the Word of God and all that. Then he talks about the judgment seat of Christ. And he says, every man will receive his own reward according to his own labor. And in the context, he's talking about getting out of the word of God. Every Christian will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, I think, for a number of things. I think God's going to deal with us about our home life, family life, how, what kind of husband, father we were, what kind of mother and wife we were, what kind of child we were, and, and everything. I believe he's going to deal with us about our money. I believe he's going to deal with us about souls. What, what did we do with our money to get the gospel out. You say, I use my money on myself. Because I love me, myself, and I. Go ahead. But the Lord is the one that you have to stand before. Yeah, I don't want to be naked. I'm not saying you have to give every dime to the church. I'm not saying you got... You've got to use your head. But do what God wants you to do. Tithes and offerings. But over there in Malachi 3, 8 to 11, to make a long story short, he said, well, a man robbed God, yet ye have robbed me in tithes and offerings. And you know what he says? He said, the only time in the Bible he said to prove me. It has to do with giving tithes and offerings. Now you think about that for a long time. The only time that God Almighty said to prove me now here with the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up unto you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, pour you out a blessing, not sprinkle, pour you out a blessing which shall not be room enough to receive it. You know what he said in verse 11? I love this. I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. And he talks about your fruits growing and all that kind of thing here. You know what the, you know what the application is today? Now, I don't understand how God does it, but when you do what God wants you to do with your money, and you give tithes and offerings, and you're not a tightwad, God has a way of rebuking the devourer for your sakes. You say, what do you mean? He just has a way of making things last longer for you. He has a way, if something does break down, He has a way of giving you a great deal on something because you're a giver. You say, how does God do all that? I have no idea. He's God. He just knows how to do it. 
I've heard so many stories, illustrations, examples of that. People that are givers. And they say, you know, my washer broke down or my car broke down or this or this happened or this tragedy thing or something. And God intervened somehow in a way these people didn't even know of or think of. And God provided their needs. God just has a way of doing that stuff. He just has a way of making things last longer in your home or in your life. He just has a way of intervening and interceding and and everything and doing things. I don't understand. He'll rebuke the devourer for your sakes. Spirit-filled loins. Spirit-filled hip. You think that has control over me, that billfold? Absolutely not. My wife and I give tithes and offerings. and We give a ton of money every month. We're on nine radio stations. The church pays for some of it, and my wife and I pay for the rest. You say, how much? None of your business. Amen. Because <laughs> then somebody will say, he's up there bragging. I'm trying to get the gospel out. I'm trying to get the word of God out. You say, how do you preach on the radio stations? Just like I preach here. Just like I preach around the country in my own pulpit. <sighs> Spirit-filled loins means a sacrificing hip. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians 9, 2. I've been in churches. You know what they do when they get ready to take up the offering? Everybody claps. Cheerful giver and smiles. They might not smile during the whole service, but they're supposed to smile when they're given. Amen. God loves the cheerful giver. Like one man said, he said, God will accept it from a grouch too. Amen. Even if you're not cheerful. Spirit-filled loins. Number four, quickly, let me say this. Look at Ezekiel 47 verse 5. Afterward, he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass over. <clears throat> For the waters were risen, waters to swim in. Now look at this. Went from the ankles, to the knees, to the loins, to the hands. Swim in. Here's how you swim. Hands. Now we're hands deep. There are some Christians, spiritually speaking, that are hands deep with God. Not, not a whole lot, probably, in America. But they're, they're in that fourth stage. They, they've gotten pretty deep with God. I wonder how many there are in this church that are hands deep with God. Spirit-filled hands. Spirit-filled hands are consecrated hands. Quickly here. Consecrated means hands are filled. You know, one of the first things a police officer does, I watch this live PD program. Anybody watch that? I watch, I watch that live PD uh, police program sometimes uh, on television. And uh, they have actual counsel and pulling over cars and everything. You know, the first thing they do when they get the guy, they say, get out of the car. They say, if, they don't, if they're under arrest, they definitely handcuff them. But they say, I'm just going to detain you. The guy looks like he might run, or he looks like he might be a little dangerous. So the police officer, said, put your hands behind your back. First thing to do is cuff their hands. That limits your ability to get rowdy. I mean, how, how, you, how are you going to do the police officer? Go up and go. Butt him with your head. Hands make you powerful. What do you do with your hands? Spirit-filled hands. These are swimming hands here in this text. Spirit-filled hands are consecrated hands. Police officer puts handcuffs on a person to stop their ability to hurt or fight them. It means to get wrapped up in the work of God. One reason for no revival is that people got too many irons in the fire. I know we got responsibilities and bills to pay. I understand all that. But the average church in America, you can't have revival. 
because everybody's too busy, got too many irons in the fire. No hands left for God. People somehow find time for everything but God. You ever notice that? You know what I found out in life? People find time to do what they want to do. They make the time. They don't find it. They just make the time to do it. And financially, people spend money on what they want to spend money on. I've probably said this before, but I'll tell you this. I'll go to the last point. Uh, Brother Jack Wood, pastor in Houston, Texas, his, his uh, son-in-law, Danny Farley, is a pastor now, Shady Acres Baptist Church. And uh, he, uh, Brother Wood, Brother Wood told me one time that he went to Atlanta, Atlanta, Georgia, one time and preached at a certain church. I won't tell you the church or the city or town or anything. But church, the, guy, the guy ran about four or 500. The guy's a great preacher. I heard him preach at Sammy Allen's camp meeting in Resaca, Georgia, about an hour north of Atlanta and uh, years ago. And the guy could preach, flat preach. And he had a pretty good-sized church. But he had Brother Wood in to preach a missions conference. And this pastor was telling Brother Wood about how my, my people don't have no money. And they just don't have no money, Brother Wood. And I just give him this real sad story. They just don't have no money. <laughs> <laughs> and Brother Wood said, Preacher, he said, come here for a minute. This, Brother Wood did this. You had to know Brother Wood. Brother Wood took him out into the parking lot of the church. And Brother Wood told me, he said, Brother Kogel, there wasn't a car in that parking lot that was more than five years old. Big, fine automobiles. This big, fine, suburban Atlanta church. And Brother Wood looked at the pastor and said, Brother, he said, you got more money in this church than what you think you got. People just spend money on what they want to spend money on. They don't think it's important. Things of God, not, not important. Here, here's 20 cents. Spirit-filled hands. Last of all, number five, 47, Ezekiel 47, 5, end of the verse. Waters to swim in. Here it is, a river that could not be passed over. That's, that's right here. The head. You see the head? Went from the ankles to the knees, to the loins, to the hands. Head. Couldn't pass over. Waters over the head. There are a few Christians in America that have gone that deep with God. There are some. The head is last because the head affects the whole body. Needs spirit, a spirit-filled head has spirit-filled eyes. Careful what your eyes look at. <clears throat> Job 31, verse 1, I've made a covenant with mine eyes. Spirit-filled head has spirit-filled ears. Our ears are not garbage cans for gossip, backbiting, and vulgarity and perversion. Spirit-filled head has spirit-filled tongue. James says the tongue is a world of iniquity, untamed and set on fire of hell. Over there in James 3, verses 6 to 8. I'm hurrying, I'm about done. Many tongues are sharp, bitter, tattling, critical, and lying. You get out deep enough with God, you can't reach the bottom and sling mud. Woohoo! Glory to God. Some are playing with mud turtles, tadpoles, and minnows when they could be having the power of God in their lives. Isn't that the truth? And last of all, I want to say this. 
if one gets out deep enough, they'll be completely unseen. You say unseen. Colossians 3, 2 and 3. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Next verse, verse 3. For ye are dead, and your life is hid. Hid with Christ in God. You say, I want to be seen. That's why you don't have the victory. I've got to have praise and glory and honor. And people recognize me and give me a lot of attention. You do? Why? For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. One gets out far enough, deep enough, they'll be completely unseen. How deep are you going to go with God this year? You say, I'm going to stay right where I'm at, ankles deep, preacher. No, don't. You say, I'm going to stay right where I'm at, right to the knees. No, go deeper. You say, I'm going to go to the loins. Go deeper. Go to the hands. Deeper. The water's completely over. I can't see you. Because you're hid with Christ in God. And God is getting the glory through your life. Amen. Amen. We're going to give an invitation if the pianist would come ahead.